Right, hello everyone. My name's Jason. I'm a clinical psychologist and I work with people who have medical conditions, serious medical conditions like cancer. Uh, and this is just an informal rerun of the live webinar I, uh, we did with Pseudomyxoma Survivor back in mid-January 2021. Um, just so we have a record of the webinar so people who weren't there can watch it or those who were there can watch it again so what we're going to talk about is remaining true to your values in the context of a serious illness such as pmp uh, other forms of cancer or other ongoing medical conditions so much of what we talk about in this presentation applies equally well across a number of different medical issues. And we're basically going to talk about a values-based approach to managing the various psychological challenges involved in living with cancer uh, with some specific reference to PMP. So not only am I a clinical psychologist, uh, but I have some personal experience with um, PMP itself. My wife Charlotte died in 2017 after uh, battling the disease for many years. So um, she continues to be a source of inspiration for me. She's an incredibly brave woman. And um, I like to think that some of the things I do in my professional life uh, would make her proud today. And she's a good source of motivation for me to uh, continue working with people who have medical conditions. Right, so what we're going to cover, we're going to look at life's challenges and a concept called difficult in estates. We're going to have a think about values and what they are. We're going to talk a little bit about why we might want to focus on values. We're going to look at some behavioural responses called towards and away moves. And we're also going to talk about the three ends, notice, name and normalise, and look at some other towards moves. This terminology is going to become more clear to you as we go through the workshop. Okay, so life is difficult. Now, if you've got a diagnosis like cancer or some other serious medical condition, you don't need anyone telling you that life is difficult. Um, a diagnosis like cancer is clear evidence and clear proof to you that life is hard, life is, life is unfair, and um, good people can unfortunately uh, fall to really difficult, serious, very painful life events. Um, life is full of other difficulties, not just cancer or medical conditions, and life isn't fair, as I mentioned. And unfortunately, there's little we can do to control these types of events. Um, while some things are within our realm of influence, many things aren't. And the pandemic, for example, is a really good example where this is something that's happened that's had a huge effect on our lives, particularly if, you have, if you're vulnerable, you're medically vulnerable and, and shielding. Uh, we can only kind of respond as best we can to those circumstances. Um, the other thing to remember with life being difficult is that our brains are actually hardwired to produce difficult thoughts, feelings, and physical sensations. And at a very basic level, these types of difficult experiences uh, reflect the brain survival mechanism. So when you put those points together, we see that adversity is completely normal. But we do have in some sectors of society um, a belief or an agenda, if you like, that's perpetuated that, that uh, life should be good all the time. But happiness is not the natural state for all humans. Now, life is difficult, as we discussed on the previous slide there. And you know, there is a downside to excessive positivity. It can set us up to fail, uh, give us unrealistic expectations and other unhelpful things happening in our lives. 
this relentless kind of happiness agenda, if you like, uh, tells us that if you're not happy, you're abnormal. Um, it also says that you must get rid of difficult feelings in order to have a good life. And thirdly, that you should control thoughts and feelings, difficult thoughts and feelings. And if you don't, you uh, have failed in some way. Um, there's thankfully different perspectives on this. And uh, we now know through some really good quality psychological research that negative thoughts and emotions can be helpful, they can be useful. And as I said, they do serve an important evolutionary purpose and that they developed to help us survive. So when we think about these difficult, painful, negative psychological inner experiences, we can refer to them from here as difficult inner states. And these are normal consequences of being hardwired to have uncomfortable psychological experiences. But we often give ourselves a hard time for experiencing them. When we think about difficult inner states in a bit more detail, we can break them down into different components as illustrated in this diagram here. And difficult inner states can be divided into thoughts or the cognitive element, the things that we say to ourselves, the emotional or feeling component. We can have a behavioral component or a kind of behavioral urge component. And we also have the physical or physio physiology <laughs> physiological component of um, difficult inner states. I told you this would be informal, right? So when we break those down, we can describe all sorts of difficult inner states through those constituent components. So in the live workshop, one question I posed to people was what difficult inner state are you battling with most right now? And how would you describe it in terms of those four components? So if you like, feel free to pause this video for a few moments and just have a think about how you would respond to that question yourself and have a go at describing your own most relevant or prominent difficult inner state in terms of those four components you see listed here. So if you accept uh, or can come on board at least partially with the concept that difficult inner states are an unavoidable part of life. The question then becomes, well, how do I respond to difficult inner states? And what we can actually do is use values to guide our responses to difficult inner states. And we're just going to talk about that a little bit more. Firstly, what are values? Let's have a think about what these actually are. Essentially, fundamentals, as we've defined it here, our values, are, as we define them here, sorry, are fundamental beliefs that guide thoughts and actions. So values are all about doing what matters to you. So in that sense, they're intrinsically valuable. Values are, have value um, or have worth to us because they relate to doing what actually matters to us, whatever that might be. Values are not goals. Goals, by contrast, are concrete, achievable events, situations or objects. So they're more defined um, uh, in terms of uh, things in the real world, be it behaviours or other things that exist. Values are not feelings, because uh, values are more of a cognitive or thinking um, phenomenon. Values are not outcomes either. They are instead directions, or you can think of values as a compass or a, or a roadmap. So some examples of values I've uh, put on this slide here are curiosity, personal growth, and independence. But there are many other values out there from uh, relationships to humour to autonomy. So thinking about some advantages of values or why they might be useful for us, 
Uh, one, one reason why values are useful is that they put us in the here and now. We can apply values to the current moment um, and think about how we're working towards them. Values are very flexible. So there's many different ways to act on values. So we can be quite creative in the way that we kind of live our values or demonstrate them in our, in our lives. Um, values are fulfillment orientated, right? They can give us sense of satisfaction. They can give us a sense of being true to ourselves, uh, which again speaks to or adds to the, the worth um, of values. Values can be used to check goals. So we can set goals, targets, things we want to achieve, and then cross-reference them with our values. So we can ask, are these goals I've set myself, are they values consistent? Values are also generative. So they can be used to generate many helpful things in our lives, such as goals. If you want to think about values in your own life a bit more, there's a link here on this slide that takes you to a values identification exercise. It's quite straightforward um, and it's self-explanatory. Um, it's got some instructions in there. You can find that uh, on my website and uh, feel free to download that document, fill it out to help you narrow in on what your core values are. So, you can choose if you want to give up the struggle to control the uncontrollable or try and control or suppress difficult inner states. Because we have suggested that difficult inner states are part of life, even though they're not very pleasant, we're going to come across difficult inner states. One thing you can do is choose to give up the struggle to try and control and suppress something that's, that's inevitable. When we have an unwanted psychological experience or inner experience, often the more we don't want that experience or psychological phenomena, the more of it we end up having. And this can be demonstrated in uh, attempts to suppress thoughts, which sometimes can be really counterproductive. If I say to you right now, whatever you do, don't imagine there's a pink elephant on my head. For most people, they can't help but picture that pink elephant on my head. And so suppressing thoughts, suppressing unwanted psychological experiences can cause a rebound effect where you actually just get more of it. And then you can beat yourself up or think you're a failure or you don't have any control over things that actually um, are kind of inevitable and you perhaps don't have too much control over anyway. What we can do instead of trying to suppress or eliminate difficult inner states from our lives is to focus on living life according to our values. And the link between the difficult inner state and our values is something that we call towards and away moves. And we're going to have a think about those now. So this diagram shows us that when we are confronted with or experience any kind of difficult inner state, if we recognize and acknowledge that that difficult inner state has occurred, it creates a choice point for us. So if we're able to tell ourselves, acknowledge to ourselves that a difficult inner state has occurred, then we have the ability there to choose a response or an action that takes us towards our core values, or we can choose to take a response that takes us away from our core values in response to that difficult inner state. So another question for you to think about, and please feel free to pause the video and just think this over for a few minutes. So thinking about that difficult inner state you considered earlier, have a think about what away moves you're being hooked by. So think about the difficult inner state you're grappling with and what actions that you're taking um, or thoughts that you are 
producing or responding to your difficult in a state that's taking you away from the kind of life that you want to live. Just pause the video if you like, spend a few minutes thinking about that and then start again and we'll keep going. Right, so when we think about some towards move options, we can think about three concepts called notice, name and normalize. These for me are really important towards moves to use in response to a difficult in a state occurring. So what are these towards moves, notice, name, and normalize. Well, notice is simply registering a difficult in a state, uh, having an awareness of it, being alert to it occurring in the first place. And this is where it's really useful to have a clear description of your difficult in a state within those four components uh, that we looked at earlier. So if it's really clear in your mind what a difficult in a state looks like, that makes it much easier for you to be able to notice it, be alert to it, be aware of it. And once there's this registering of a difficult in a state, from there, you can name the difficult in a state. Now, this is the conscious act of saying to yourself, right, difficult in a state's occurring here. And that's quite important. Um, and some people name their difficult in a state uh, all sorts of things, a character, a well-known character, humorous character, uh, something that they recall from a movie or a book. Um, they can give it some sort of label, um, you know, like the critic, um, something like that. And that naming, or what psychologists call um, externalizing uh, or personalizing is, is a way to um, make the difficult in a state more of a clear kind of mental entity in your mind. So notice and name, really important, go hand in hand with each other. And the third important N I talk about as a towards move is a concept called normalize or normalizing. Now, as we saw in the earlier slides, we talked about the fact that life is difficult and Unfortunately, pain and adversity are a part of life. So we also talked about um, kind of overdoing things on the happiness and the happiness department, overdoing things in terms of expectations and setting yourself up to fail or being self-critical if you're not happy all the time. So those two things or those two uh, points that we made earlier can be quite useful in helping us to normalize a difficult in a state. And normalizing a difficult in a state involves that acknowledgement that life is not always easy. We are going to have um, difficult moments. And this really is no reflection on who we are as people, our mental strength, our abilities. Um, so normalize is helping you to step back from any potential self-criticism uh, so we avoid making that difficult in a state even bigger to deal with. So if we think about this screwed up piece of paper as a difficult in a state, when we don't normalize, when we're quite critical, when we beat ourselves up for feeling low, feeling anxious, whatever it may be, that self-criticism or that judgment just makes this original pile or ball is difficult in a state even bigger. So now we've gone from just trying to deal with that to dealing with something much bigger. So just from a pragmatical, practical point of view, this self-criticism or um, negative self-judgment just puts us into a much worse state or more challenging state to extract ourselves from. Notice the name is really taking you off autopilot. Quite often difficult in a state, particularly if we're experiencing them quite, quite frequently, almost become the new normal or that they, they become such a part of your life it is difficult to stop and sit back and, and see them happening. 
So this is why another reason why notice the name is so important. And as I said, normalize is important for stopping any self beat up. And um, it's here as your first towards move, but really it's, you know, it's part of that, that initial um, crucial set of towards moves of notice them and normalize. We say that probably normalize is your first really active uh, towards move strategy. All right, okay. So from those three ends, notice them and normalize, you've really got endless possibilities um, with regards to your next towards move or towards moves. And again, this is where uh, the, val the value of values come in, right? So the, one of the reasons why we're able to generate lots of different towards move options, because as I said before, values are generative um, and we can live our values in all sorts of ways. Therefore, there's lots of possibilities for towards moves. The most important question to ask when you notice and name that difficult inner state is to ask yourself, what takes me towards my values or the life I want to live uh, from this point, given I've recognized this difficult inner state has arisen? Um, and we can think about um, other things we can do, other uh, 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 towards moves we can engage in to reduce the chance that we're going to get hooked by these away moves. Um, we can pause in some way, we can engage in diaphragmatic breathing, or we can uh, engage in something called unhooking. So we're just trying to give you some more ideas basically for towards moves. And one towards move is diaphragmatic breathing. And a lot of people find this quite helpful because it helps them to kind of pause and stop the quick leaping to away moves. And physiologically, uh, it can be quite a nice way just to kind of calm that alarm system down a little bit. And so I'm gonna demonstrate that for you now really briefly, diaphragmatic breathing size. So what I want you to do is sit comfortably with your arms and legs in a relaxed posture and just gently close your eyes. And what I'm gonna get you to do initially is just to notice that you're breathing. And I just want you to observe the breath coming in and out of your body through your nose if possible. Just don't try and manipulate that breath in any way at this stage. Just want you to notice the breath coming in and out. Now, the next thing I want you to do is think about filling your lungs on the in-breath till they're around about 75% of full capacity. So you want to breathe in to around about 75% full. But when you breathe out, I want you to breathe out 100% of that air. So I want you to breathe it all the way out. So there's absolutely nothing left in those lungs before you return to this in-breath uh, where you're breathing in to around about 75% again. And just continue that cycle for the next few moments. The next thing I'm going to get you to do is imagine on the in-breath that you're filling your lungs from the bottom up towards the top, like a bucket fills with water to around about 75% full, and again breathing out 100%. If it helps you, you can think about breathing in through your toes and the air coming up the legs and into the bottom of the lungs, gradually filling up towards the top to around about 75% full, and then breathe out 100% again. So I'll just get you to stick with that for a few moments.
So just take a few more of those breaths in your own time. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes again. Righto, so that's diaphragm breathing. And that can, for some people, be a really nice towards move um, or as a way to pause by thinking about what you're gonna do next uh, in terms of towards moves options. Right, so, so another potentially useful strategy that people can use is something called unhooking. So as we talked about earlier, in the talk, difficult inner states have this cognitive or thinking component to it. And what we can try and do is mentally step back from those thoughts or unhook from them as a way to kind of just loosen their grip on us. Because as you know, unpleasant kind of thoughts and images can really ramp up the difficult inner state quite, quite quickly and be pretty unpleasant things to experience. So we want to try and do this mental standing back from our thoughts and that, that, that it come as part of a difficult inner state. And also it's quite a good way for suspending the self beat up that you may be prone to doing. And when we think about unhooking, there's all sorts of ways we can do this. But just to give you a flavor for it and a few examples, we can think about verbal approaches to unhooking. So you have an unpleasant thought such as I'm a loser. What you can do is restate that thought to yourself, but add to the front of the thought, the phrase, I'm having the thought. So I'm a loser becomes, I'm having the thought, I'm a loser. So this is a way to very explicitly remind yourself that what's happened here is a thought rather than getting slapped with a slice of reality. So suddenly you're, you're not literally a loser. Suddenly you're like, you, you've experienced this unpleasant thought that I'm a loser, which, which are two very different things. We can unhook visually. So you can gently close your eyes and imagine that you're just watching the contents of your brain or the thoughts that your brain's producing, um, watching them as if they are appearing on a screen, a TV or computer screen, or they're appearing in clouds in the sky. And the trick here is not to manipulate this, this um, visual image in any way. You just watch it as a curious, interested spectator, not trying to judge the thoughts, not trying to manipulate the thoughts, just letting them do whatever they want, come and go in their own time. And as I said, watching them as if they're uh, words on a screen or printed in clouds on the sky. So that's a, a visual way to unhook that some people find useful. Another way to unhook is to externalize. So we can externalize or try and take the thought outside of our body metaphorically by um, giving the uh, thought um, a name, assigning it a character, uh, restating it to yourself in a really funny voice. Um, I'm a loser. Hearing I'm a loser in your head to the voice of say Daffy Duck um, often for people makes it feel a bit less threatening because it's a bit more nonsensical, a bit more humorous. Um, or restating the thought to the sound of music, a funny song or a piece of music that's completely kind of incongruent or doesn't match um, the, the content of the thought itself. So many different ways to unhook. Some people find unhooking a really useful strategy. Other people, not so much. Absolutely fine. We're just giving you a feel for some of the range of towards move, move options that are out there for you. So what towards moves have you utilized? So you've had to think about a prominent difficult in a state in your life. We've had to think about some of the away moves that you might engage with in response to that. But uh, most people have some good coping strategies and this is a chance to reflect on what towards moves you utilize or have been utilizing. So again, just pause the recording, make a note of those and then come back.
So we've run through some of the possibilities for towards moves. And as I said, as I keep saying, there's lots of other possibilities here. You can think about uh, simply asking the question, well, what actions, what behavior could I undertake now that would reflect one or more of my values in this situation? And another quite important and potentially useful towards moves is challenging thoughts or looking at thoughts within our difficult in a state from a different perspective. And we've got lots and lots of resources and books on that. Um, one book that is quite good, as just an example, is called Mind Over Mood. It's uh, written by two psychologists, Greenberger and Pedeski. Um, but there's lots of other um, good options out there to help you develop some skills around challenging thoughts. Now, if you're a carer, um, I've got a freely available ebook again on my website that you can download because um, there's several of today's strategies or strategies we cover in this particular talk within that text itself. So if you want to think more about how these strategies and skills apply to you if you're a carer um, or supporting someone with cancer or some other form of illness, then this might be useful for you. Right. So trying to draw these strands together in a summary for you. What we talked about is that life can be really difficult and this is completely normal. Life is not easy. Um, you're not imagining it. We have a natural tendency to experience difficult inner states. We're kind of hardwired to do this. This is part of life. The negative is just as kind of normal and natural as, as the positive in terms of psychological experiences we can have in life. We can use our values to guide difficult inner state responses via these towards and away moves. And as I've suggested, notice them normalize, I think are really key towards moves to practice. But from there, there's endless possibilities, some of which we've covered in this talk. So at this point in the live presentation, um, through the floor open for some questions. Obviously, we can't do this on the recording, but you can feel really free to email me if you've got some follow-up questions. Very easy to find me online, just Google my name. And um, actually, I think we've got my website there with my ugly mug. Apologies for that, jasonspinler.com or thepracticalpsych.com. Both will take you to my website and you can see some resources, get my contact details. So feel free to reach out anytime. Um, and don't forget about Sierra McSoma Survivor, fantastic charity, which is there to provide support um, and doing all sorts of good things amongst the PMP community. Thanks very much for watching. Uh, there is talk two and three to come. So please feel free to watch those. In each of those talks, we build on some of these skills that we've talked about in this talk through uh, some different topics. Right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.